I'm a recent subscriber from Germany, and this is a story that happened many years ago in my hometown. It's quite an old story, but it's something that you can most certainly verify via news stories because this was a very famous story in Germany at the time of its occurrence. And so a few houses down from me in the street where I grew up, there was this old guy who lived with his wife and dog in a big detached house. He was a bit of a shut-in, as you might say, and I never saw him talking to anyone, and the only reason you ever saw him leave his house was just to go walk his dog. We lived on the same street in peace for the longest time, and although he seemed very antisocial, everything appeared to be regular. Then one day, things started to go downhill. At some point, people started to notice how the car belonging to the man's wife was no longer in the driveway, and then later on, it was confirmed that she had divorced him and moved away. This was only discovered because the lady's former work colleague just so happened to have bumped into a neighbor, so it took two weeks for people to realize that she was gone for good. We were sad for him, but it is a fact of life that marriages do fall apart, and he seemed to be acting like his usual self, so no alarms were raised. One morning, sometime later, I left my house at the usual time to catch the school bus. Our street is relatively quiet, and... Normally, there isn't much stuff going on, but on this particular morning, things were looking very different. There were a few neighbors on the street, and my parents said that there's something wrong with the old guy, which lived on the end of the street, but nothing specific was known at that time. Everyone seemed very worried because apparently he'd gotten into an argument with someone while walking his dog, and this neighbor was shocked that he was even talking to them, so when the man started screaming about something... People were shocked enough to come out of their houses to see what was going on. You can just imagine, this man has not talked to anyone for quite literally years, and then all of a sudden he decides to begin screaming in the street, and it made for quite a spectacle. I wanted to stay and see what was going on, but my mother and father insisted that I make my way to school and avoid being late. And so off I went, and for the whole day, I thought about it every so often. I wasn't obsessed, but I was curious to see if the man had been arrested or taken away, or if there had been any further confrontations. I was actually quite excited to hear from my mother and father what had happened, but to think of that feeling now makes me feel a deep shame in myself, because what I arrived home to was not entertaining. As I returned and exited the bus at the bus stop, I saw that the whole street was completely blocked off and evacuated. Police cars and officers were everywhere, and even a SWAT team was there. I had no idea what was going on, so I rushed to the house, met with my parents, and they explained to me that the old guy tried to destroy the entire street in some kind of manic episode. He flooded his entire basement with gas and had an improvised bomb in his garden shed which was essentially a big pile of propane gas tanks tied together. A timer clock and a toaster served as the fuse mechanism for both the bomb and the basement, and the whole thing was rigged to explode between 7 to 8 a.m. in the morning, with a smaller version of this explosive being placed in the recycling bin of the neighbors directly next to him. Before the old man triggered the bomb, he wrecked the entire interior of his house by smashing and breaking everything. He then went to the garage and carried on the destruction, which is strangely how he got caught. A neighbor then heard all the noise and became suspicious. He looked through the garage window, and the fumes were so strong that he noticed the distinctive smell of gasoline. He broke the door to enter the house and discovered the mess the old guy had created. And that's what started the so-called argument that everyone had heard that morning. The neighbor immediately called the cops after the screaming had finished, and that's when everyone was waiting outside. But right at the same time my parents scolded me and told me to hurry along to school, our neighbor was trying his best to activate the explosive devices and blow us all the kingdom come, as they say. The bomb squad from the city police force later said it was a miracle that the device did not detonate. It was well put together with the only parts that were suboptimal being the timer and detonator. If our neighbor had taken just a little more care when putting together these two aspects of his device, I would most certainly not be around to write this to you. 
The police arrived not long after I departed and after gaining entry to the home, they arrested the man before he could correct his mistakes and detonate the device. And for a while, it looked like we were going to have to stay in a hotel overnight, but the bomb squad managed to remove the device around an hour after I arrived home from school and we were able to re-enter our houses once the police truck had departed. I heard that after he was arrested, the man was deemed unfit to stand trial and basically went straight from the courtroom to a psychiatric hospital where he has remained ever since. From what I understand, he is very unlikely to ever be discharged as his psychological condition has not improved and he still harbors a very deep hatred of the world around him. I live in a very rural area in Tennessee, and this happened either in the summer of 92 or 93, so I was a preteen, and I can still see this in my mind like it happened yesterday. Like I said before, a rural area in Tennessee where we used to have some serious issues with people dumping unwanted, worn out items and garbage down on our beautiful hillsides and ravines. At that time, it was common to find illegal dumping sites everywhere because there was no bulk pickup offered by our one waste disposal monopoly. And in this part of the state, the economic disparity is obvious. You have some of the poorest people and some multiple mansion and vacation home folks. My family fell somewhere in the upper middle class, thinking Titanic we would be in either the lowest rung of first class or the very top of second class. Unfortunately, the majority would be in steerage or the coal bunker. Well, it was August in Tennessee, aka sun-scorching heat and enough humidity to make it slightly uncomfortable to breathe. Many describe it as the swamp-ass capital of the state. Anyway, we had just had an extraordinarily rare murder in our county. It was all that anyone was talking about, and it was all you heard in our churches and beauty salons. The victim was largely unknown a woman in her early thirties and nowhere near wealthy. I didn't know her, nor did anyone. She had just moved here less than a year ago and kept to herself and had not been reported missing. Then just before our summer break came to an end, this lady was found at the base of a steep incline, deep in one of our densely wooded areas by some folks out for a nature hike. And there she was found, at the base of a large illegal dump on a winding dirt road that was barely wide enough for one vehicle. If you ever met another car, one would have to pull over so far you were almost off the road entirely. Even creepier, the road was named Bone Road. Yeah. When she was found, she had lost everything from the neck up, but both her upper and lower areas were recovered, and her killer had not been caught. So my mom was born and raised here and was of a strong yet goofy stock. She had always been my best buddy, even when dropping the hammer on my brother and me, and she was loved by every student that she had ever taught. Our friends adored my goofy mama and often telling me how lucky I was to have her. My dad was a pharmacist in our area, smarter than most, and happy to go fill a lost or forgotten prescription even late into the night. My dad isn't from here, but is very well known because of his job. Everyone knows my mama because she and most of our huge family have been here since our ancestors settled here in the 1800s. The rest of her family lived in Middle Tennessee. On that day in August, we had been in a family reunion picnic at the beautiful naturally made lake that we lived near. Suddenly, a scattered thunderstorm had popped up and brought our get-together to an end. It was just me and my mom, but on the ride home, we decided that we were Sherlock Holmes and Watson. We wanted to see the crime scene. I know, brilliant. My dad was at work and my brother was with a friend, and this was 92 or 93, so no GPS, Alexa, Siri, or Google Earth, not even MapQuest. My dad was on our school board and had been given a highly detailed map of our entire county. Since neither of us knew how to reach Bone Road, it was agreed that the map would be our guide. We went home, grabbed the map, and set out like we were Magellan and we eventually found the place and headed to the spot. Being the ignorant rubberneckers that we were, we just planned to drive past this stupid dump site. I can't explain how creepy this place was, though. A murder dump in the middle of BFE, on a road that started with blacktop, transitioned to gravel, and then good old dirt. 
It was mid-afternoon, but the sudden rain on the August ground made the area steamy. Literal steam was emanating from the road, the fields, the woods, and everywhere, and that just added to the thrill of her folly. And as we approached the location, there was a blind curve, making it impossible to see the place until we were right up on it. When we rounded that corner, we saw that we weren't alone. A very dirty man had his very dirty truck pulled over at the dump just far enough to allow us to pass. Sure, Joe Dirt could have been just another looky-loo like us, but he gave off a creepy vibe. Just standing by his truck, looking down into the dump site, it wasn't a sheriff's officer, and we know all our local authorities and they had cleared the location a day or so before, anyone could access the area. And as we squeezed past his truck, he was standing on the passenger side of our car. I'm 12 or 13, I can't drive, so he was on my side as we passed, so close to him that I could see his two teeth clear as day. He just smiled in his uber, creeptastic, almost leering way. Not nice, and not friendly. We got past and thanked the Lord that Mr. Two Tooth hadn't followed us, and we agreed that we could reach the end of Bone Road and just get the hell out of there. Oh, you know there's a but. We reached the end of Bone Road, ending at a field, and Bone Road was a dead end, no pun intended. My mom said the words that I had been screaming in my head. Oh, F. We had no choice. We had to do a five-point turn to go back from where we came. Oh, I bet he's gone now, my mom's feeble attempt to soothe us both. And guess what? He was still there, still smiling his huge two-tooth smile. And now as my adult self reflected on this, he could have come after us, knowing that we would be cornered, but neither of us have ever been accused of being too rational. We made it out unscathed, of course, and my dad hit the roof when he heard the tapestry of idiocy our afternoon adventure was. But you know there's always a but. Days later, our newspaper heralded the good news that that murderer was caught. The woman had been killed by a boyfriend turned stalker. She had moved here from a town about 45 minutes away to get away from him, but he had found her. He just drove around with her body in his truck before happening upon this dump site. Happily ever after, not quite. And as we stared down at this guy's mugshot, it was real. Mr. Two Tooth was her killer. But we never told my dad that part. Mr. Two Tooth was convicted of first degree murder and abuse of a corpse. He'll die in the state prison system serving life with no parole. Still, Mom and I promised that we would never be so dumb again. We still have weird adventures, but not to freaky remote murder dump sites on unknown terrain and with no one knowing where we are. We really could have met our literal dead end. It's an odd thing, knowing that you had been face to face with a brutal murderer. Not once, but twice. I have a really bizarre story to tell. It happened a few months back. So there was this wedding coming up that I was going to with my wife. We were guests and I had to go to a tailor for my suit. Obviously, I had no idea what tailor I was supposed to go to, but I remembered my wife told me that she knew of one that her family had been going to for years. That was fine with me. So the next evening after work, I stopped by. Now, on this day, I worked particularly late, which is something that occasionally happens. It was like 8 p.m. and dark outside. I put in the address to the tailor and followed it. When I arrived, I was in the parking lot of this old, run-down-looking mall. There were hardly any other cars in the entire parking lot. At first, I thought that this had to be a mistake. Then, I looked on the map again, and it showed that the tailor was inside of the mall. I was already thinking of how I was going to tease my wife for having me stop at this abandoned looking mall. It said they were open though, so I got out of my car and walked inside. When I first got in the mall, it was a very strange feeling because the place was literally 90% abandoned. There were hardly any lights on and there were countless closed up stores. Most of them were completely empty, but a few still had their signs up and some things inside. As you could guess, there was not a single other person in sight. 
I was even wondering myself if I was supposed to be in here. So I started walking the hallways looking for the tailor shop. As I was walking, I remember I passed by this one store. It looked to be a clothing store, at least that's what it used to be. It was closed, and it looked like it had only been closed for maybe the past year. I could see that there was still some merchandise inside, but it was messy and stuff. But I also noticed that the door to the store was propped open. I figured maybe they were in the process of clearing it out or something. But as I was looking and passing it by, I saw somebody was actually inside of the store. It was a man who was wearing jeans and a hooded sweatshirt. I remember that he was passing by the giant window, and then he looked over and he saw me. Then, after looking in my direction, he quickly turned and literally ran out of my view. I was now thinking that he was not supposed to be in there or something. What he was doing, I didn't know. I didn't really care either. I kept walking and I just ignored it. I turned and went down another hallway that was mostly abandoned as well. But finally, at the end of this, there was one sign lit up and in working order that said Taylor. So I walked to the end and entered the store. It was in fact open and in business. I honestly couldn't believe it. So I went inside and I got my measurements and stuff and was in the store for maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Then I left and it was time to walk back through the quiet mall to leave. I went down the first hallway and then I turned into the next one. Now I was in the main first hallway that led out to the parking lot. I remember as I was passing by one of the clothing stores again, I saw that the door was still propped open and the guy who I had seen before was still there. This time, he was looking right at me from the other side of the window. I thought that it was weird how he was just staring at me, but I ignored it and I passed him by. Then, right after I had passed the store, I heard the door opening and then footsteps. I didn't look back, but as I kept going, I heard the footsteps walking in my direction behind me. For some reason, this guy was now leaving the store and walking behind me. Was he following me? I didn't know. He did not say anything and neither did I. I kept walking and I soon reached the exit doors. The man was walking probably about 30 or 40 feet behind me. When I was going through the doors, it sounded like the man behind me was starting to speed up. After I got outside, I looked behind just for a second and I saw the man fling the doors open at a fast speed. Right after seeing that, I just started sprinting from my car. When I started to run, I heard the man behind me starting to run as well. I went as fast as I could and luckily I have decent speed. When I reached my car, I stopped, got out the keys as fast as possible and hit unlock over and over. Then I grabbed the door, opened it, got inside and slammed it shut. After I had locked the door, the man reached it probably two or three seconds later. When he reached my door and tried to open it, I was starting my engine. He punched at the window twice before I was able to drive off. Luckily it didn't break. I left and then called the cops when I got on the road. I reported what happened and was honestly very confused myself as to what had even took place. I went home and told my wife all about the event. Looking back, I really don't know why that man went after me. I'm guessing he was trying to rob me and was maybe trying to steal from the abandoned store as well. Since this happened, I joked with my wife for a long time how she sent me to an abandoned mall to get robbed. I did return to the mall to go to the tailor again but I went much earlier in the day and was fine. But this remains one of the scariest moments of my life. From the ages of around 6 to 11, my family and I lived in a very rough neighborhood. One night it was just my mom, myself, and my two siblings at home. My dad used to drive truck for a living, which obviously meant that he was away an awful lot, meaning a lot of the time it was just our mom taking care of us. That night at around midnight, someone started ringing our apartment's buzzer. My mom woke up and went to the little intercom to ask who it was, and no one answered. She thought that maybe it was some kids playing Ding Dong Ditch or something juvenile like that, so... Instead of being scared, she was just annoyed as she went back to bed. But then about 30 minutes later, someone starts buzzing for a second time. Mom gets up again and peers through the side window to see if she can spot anyone out there, but she can't see a single living soul, and that's when she started to freak out. She goes back to the room and grabs my dad's gun, 
and then sits in the living room in the dark just waiting for someone to try and break in. After God knows how long, there was another buzz. This time, Mom said she very calmly explained that if they carried on harassing us, she was going to call the cops, and if they tried to break in, she would shoot them. Again, there was no response, so she went back to the window to see if she could spot anyone in that time. She did. She said that there were three guys out there, faces covered, all looking up at the window, all looking right at her. Mom said she rushed to call the cops, all the while me and my two siblings were asleep in our bedroom. No one tried to break in right away, but my mom had to wait for an hour for the cops to finally show up, and when they did... They buzzed our buzzer, causing her to freak out one more time, thinking that the masked men were outside again. Thankfully, it was the cops, and she invited them up to do a quick look and around the outside of the apartment building to make sure no one was hanging around. After their search, they tell my mom that they had found a piece of barbed wire about four feet long next to the front door and asked if it belonged to my mom. She said that it wasn't hers and asked why. The cop then told her that there was a chance that it belonged to whoever was knocking at the door. Mom asked if they thought the people were planning on using it, and although they assured her that there was no way of knowing that, she's convinced to this day that they were planning on torturing us. However, what the cops did confirm is that she was very smart not to open the door to see who was there, otherwise it could have cost her her life. They also said that they'd patrol the neighborhood until morning and do a thorough investigation once there was daylight. And later on that morning, once my siblings and I were at school, they called back to talk to her about something. They said that when they were searching around the house, they found footprints leading around to the back of the home, leading up to my bedroom window. You see, our apartment was on the second floor, so scarily accessible to anyone with a fairly long ladder. They also found nicks in the window seal where the person, or persons, were trying to pry open the window to break in, but failed. My mom always suspected that one of our neighbors had been involved, because he would always stare very creepily at my mom whenever they crossed paths. He also knew when my dad wasn't home since he knows what vehicle he drives. Mom said that was the final straw of wanting to get the hell out of that place, and as soon as my dad came home, she gave him a very strong ultimatum. Find us some place else to live or she was leaving him and taking us kids with her. And so within six months we were living somewhere else and I celebrated my 12th birthday someplace where she actually felt safe and not in a neighborhood where she felt like she needed to sleep with one eye open. This happened back when I was eight years old. Back then, I had a friend named Max. Max and I were friends from school and would hang out at each other's houses. I remember that one Friday night, I got invited to sleep over at his house. For the most part, Max's family had a pretty average house in a common neighborhood. The living room of the house was at the front end and the kitchen was towards the back. The bedrooms were located upstairs. So I went to his house after school with my sleeping bag, toothbrush, and some other stuff. My mom was going to pick me up from his house the next morning. When I got there, I remember I had pizza with Max and his family and we hung out. Later on in the night, I don't remember exactly why, but for some reason we were going to sleep in the living room. Maybe it was because that's where the TV was, or maybe it was just because there was more space there but both Max and I put our sleeping bags on the floor down in the living room. When it got late, Max's parents and sister went up to bed and the two of us hung out in the living room. We didn't stay up that much longer though because Max got tired pretty quickly. I remember that he got into his sleeping bag and was soon out. I, on the other hand, was not that tired. I remember laying down, getting under my covers and closing my eyes, but for some reason, I just couldn't sleep. I really didn't feel tired at all. I didn't have a cell phone or anything way back then, so I was pretty bored. I was just laying there in the dark, looking around the living room, or trying to sleep. This went on for what felt like a really long time. I would say that it was at least 30 minutes to an hour. 
the house was very dark and also completely silent. Then, suddenly, out of nowhere, I heard the sound of the garage door open. It was the door that led from the garage to the pantry which was next to the dining room. When I heard it, I was really surprised. I had no idea who that would be. For a moment, I thought maybe it was Max's father, but I had literally seen everybody in his family go up to bed in the other direction. I also could not see the garage door from where I was. You see, the living room was completely closed off from that part of the house. You had to go around a corner and enter the kitchen. Then you would have a view of the dining room and pantry area. I could only see a small part of the kitchen from where I was, and it was the opposite direction. After I heard the door open, I briefly heard footsteps which were really quiet, but then things were pretty much silent again. I quickly became really nervous, fearing that it might be an intruder. I was expecting whoever it was to probably walk through the kitchen and either go into the living room or go upstairs. Either way, that would be walking by me if they did. I laid in my sleeping bag and did not make a sound at all, but I did look over to the corner. I didn't see anything, but I was half expecting to see somebody walk around the corner at any moment, but as I continued to watch, I didn't see anyone. I did not hear anything more either. I definitely was not tired now. I just kept laying there, not knowing what to do or what was going on for the longest time. Maybe 10 or 15 minutes later, I still hadn't heard or seen anything and I decided to wake Max up. I went over to him and tapped his shoulder. After a few tries, he awoke, and he asked me what was going on. I told him that I heard the garage door to the house open, and I thought that somebody had entered. He asked me if I was joking, and when I said no, he seemed to wake up. After whispering to each other and discussing it for a few moments, we decided to go and look. I was pretty nervous, but Max and I got up and walked over to the corner to go and see. We walked over and right before we reached the wall and entrance of the kitchen, we heard the sound of the door opening again. Then, as we looked around the corner, we were just in time to see the garage door closing and somebody walking out of it. We did not get a good look at all of who the person was, but we could tell that somebody had been there. After the door to the garage shut, Max and I were both completely shocked. Max then ran over to the garage door and locked it. After that, he sprinted back over to the living room and said he was going to wake up his parents. I waited in the living room as Max went upstairs and returned about a minute later with his parents. They came down and Max's father walked into the garage. We discussed what happened with his mother and a few minutes later his father returned inside. He said that whoever was there had left. Max's father even looked around the backyard a little bit and was confident that he didn't see anyone. At that point everybody pretty much went back to bed. Max's parents went back upstairs and Max and I got back into our sleeping bags. Now, Max once again fell asleep relatively fast, and I once more could not. I laid there awake for at least another 30 minutes. Things were completely silent. However, I finally started to feel relaxed and even a little bit sleepy. But just then, those feelings were interrupted when I heard the garage door knob turn. With it being locked though, the door did not open. I figured that the person was back. Luckily, they were not able to get inside. I just heard them try the door that one time. I kept laying there and listening. There were no more noises. Eventually, I was able to fall asleep. The next morning, I told Max about hearing the doorknob turn again the previous night. We told his parents as well, and his dad searched the entire property. However, whoever had been there must have actually been gone then, because he didn't find anything. My mom soon came and picked me up after that. I didn't really hear anything more of it from Max. I stayed over at his house a few more times, and nothing like that ever happened again. Years ago, when I was 14, I had a really crazy experience when my friend came to sleep over. My best friend Ryan was coming over to hang out and spend the night. On this night in particular, it was a weekend, and my sister was staying over at her friend's house. Meanwhile, my parents were there, but they went out for the night, and Ryan and I stayed at the house. We were just playing video games in my room, which was what we typically do when hanging out. After a while of this, I remember that there was a knock at the front door to the house. We paused the game and went down the hallway and over to the front door. I looked out of the window first, and I saw a woman standing there on the front step. 
She appeared to be sort of young and had shorter, dark hair. I had never seen her before, though. I ended up answering the door, and the woman told us that her car broke down and she needed some help. When I asked her what she needed help with, she asked if we could come over and look at her car. Neither of us really knew anything about cars, though. I told the woman that I wouldn't be much help and told her that she should call a mechanic or something. The woman still asked us to come over to her car. I did not see her car, but I assumed that it was down the street. As a kid who didn't even have my license, I knew that I wouldn't be any help. I asked the woman what happened to her car though. If it was a flat tire or something like that, maybe we would be able to assist her. She said that she didn't know, but the engine wouldn't start. I knew that was outside of our ability to help, and I told her that we couldn't, but maybe somebody else could. I also had a sort of bad feeling about it as well. So finally, the woman said okay, and she started walking off. I went back inside, and Ryan and I then went back to my room. We continued playing video games for a while. I remember, though, at one point, I left the room. As I was passing by the front window, I saw the same woman was back, and she was walking through the front yard. I stopped and watched to see where she would go. The woman ended up leaving the yard and going back out into the street. She didn't seem to notice me watching her but my bad feeling about the woman stayed the same and I wondered what she was up to. It had been a little while since she had been at my house. I would have guessed that she would have kept going to the neighbors until somebody would help her or something. But after she left the property, I just continued on. Ryan and I kept playing video games together until at least another hour after that. As we were both sitting in my bedroom, we had a view of my window into the backyard a little. Both at once, we noticed movement in the backyard. After a closer look, we noticed that the woman was now walking in the backyard. I really couldn't believe that she was back yet again. We stopped our game and both walked over to the window. The woman walked through the yard and towards the back side of the house. She was not heading directly towards us, but possibly towards the back door which was down a ways. I opened my window just a crack and yelled to the woman asking her what she was doing. The woman instantly stopped and then looked over at us. She said once again that her car broke down. Then she started walking over to us at the window, and I could hear her asking if we could come help with her car. I couldn't believe that she was asking us again, and I wondered if the woman was either on drugs or if something was wrong with her. I told her that she had already asked us that. The woman walked all the way until she was right on the other side of the window though, and then she continued. She asked us if we could come out and go over to her car and help her with it. I told her no again, and asked her to leave our yard. When the woman stayed there, I told her that I was going to call the police and they could help her with her car situation. After hearing that, it seemed to anger the woman. She said no very loudly. When I asked why not, the woman then made a fist and punched the window extremely hard. Ryan and I both jumped back. Then the woman took off running, seeming to sprint as fast as she could out of the yard. We went around to the front of the house and watched her make her way into the street and then go out of sight. Ryan and I did call the police then, and we told them of the whole situation. The woman was acting very suspicious, if nothing else. They came out and we talked to them briefly, and they said they would go look for the woman. I didn't hear anything more about it though. Soon after, my parents returned home. Ryan stayed the night, and we had no more interactions with the woman. Sometimes I wonder if she even had a car, or if she was just trying to get us out of the house for some reason. I really don't know where she came from, or where she went either. It was really weird. I work at this small perfume store in a large mall. This mall has literally hundreds of stores inside of it. The store that I work at is one of the smaller ones, and it only requires one employee at a time. We sell all kinds of perfumes as well as a few skin products. Our store is open until the time the mall closes, which is 8 p.m. So one time I was working at the store until 8, and I would be by myself for the shift. Normally, the store is pretty quiet. Sometimes if the mall is really busy, we'll get a lot of customers, but usually there are not that many people in the store at once. I was sitting behind the counter, which faced directly to the entrance and a large window on either side of the entrance doors. The day went by as usual for the most part. We got some customers here and there, but it was mostly quiet. At probably like 5 or 6 o'clock though, something strange happened. I remember that nobody was in the store at that particular time, 
and I was just sitting behind the counter. Then I noticed this man walking past the store, and he was wearing this creepy looking mask. It was not quite a clown mask, but it looked sort of similar. He turned and then looked into the window at me and pressed his face up against the glass. It was quite creepy, but I figured it to be a joke and I laughed it off. He stayed at the window for an uncomfortable amount of time, probably over a minute. Then he finally stopped and walked a distance away. Before he passed by the store completely though, he stopped again and then looked in once more. He stared for a little while before finally turning and walking away. It was very weird. Over the next hour or so, I got a few more customers and we made a few sales. People would walk past the shop down the mall hallway all the time, but the later it got, the quieter it became. Then at about seven o'clock, I saw the man again. He walked past the shop once more and did not stop, but turned and looked at me as he passed by. It was very interesting and I didn't really know what this guy was doing walking around the mall like that. I figured that he was probably messing with a lot of people and trying to get a reaction out of them. I didn't see the man for the rest of the time that we were open though. Then at 8 o'clock I went over to the entrance and I closed our two glass doors and then locked them. After that I just had to finish up by doing a few things and then I could leave for the night. I went back to the counter and would be able to leave in probably 5 minutes. As I was behind the counter though, I saw that the man was back. The same guy, still wearing his creepy mask. He stopped right in front of the two doors and started to stare at me. Then he came to the doors and tried opening them, but they were locked. After that, he started to walk away. I figured that he was leaving the mall. After all, it was now closed and no stores inside would be open anymore. The man did not go out of my sight though. Instead, when he reached the end of the store, he turned around and walked back. Then he kind of started pacing back and forth in front of the shop and looking in at me almost the entire time. I tried my best to ignore him. Soon though, I was done with work and I wanted to leave, but I really didn't want to leave with this guy out front. I was hoping that he would just go away, but he didn't. After several more minutes with him still there, I was starting to get impatient. I hoped that one of the mall security guards would see him and tell him that he had to go. By now, he was probably one of the last people left in the mall, if not the last. He continued to stand around and look at me every so often. Sometimes he would pace around a little, but he would never move out of my sight. It was like he was just waiting for me to leave because he knew that I was off now, but I wasn't going to. I didn't know who this guy was or what he was capable of doing. Before, I figured him to be harmless, but now I wasn't so sure. This went on for several more minutes. Then. Finally, I saw one of the mall security guards come into my view in front of the store. He started speaking to the man. I couldn't really hear what was being said exactly. I could just really hear their voices. Not long at all after they started speaking, the masked man started walking away and went out of sight. The security guard followed. There was not too much of an interaction, and most likely the guard was just telling him that the mall was closed and he had to go now. Still, I waited a couple of minutes and made sure that the guy didn't return. Then I was finally able to leave the store. I walked the now empty hallways of the mall and then out to my car in the parking lot. When I got outside and into the parking lot, I remember looking to my left. One of the first things that I noticed was the masked man. He was just sort of standing around like a hundred feet away. He was sort of near another set of entrance doors and was standing on the sidewalk out front. I just hoped that he would not look over and see me. I walked as fast as I could to get to my car, and I was able to get there okay. Then I quickly left. When I did, I saw the guy still standing in the parking lot. I don't know if he was waiting for me to leave or what. Maybe he thought that I was going to exit out of the other doors. But either way, I was glad that I was just able to get out safely and make it back home. And after that, I never noticed the guy again. I still wonder sometimes what his plans were. This account pertains to my current upstairs neighbor. He disappears for weeks at a time, and then will suddenly hear what sounds like a slaughterhouse happening at 11pm on a weeknight, announcing that he's now home. There's been a lot of things that have happened, but the top two that pretty much sum up everything you need to know about just how creepy this guy is, 
is this. One day I was bringing up groceries and he offered to help. I told him thank you and assumed that he would just take the bags to the second floor landing, place them outside the door and then continue up to his apartment like our other neighbor who has done this exact thing before. He follows me back out to my car and then stands about four inches behind me as I lean into the trunk of my car to get the last two bags. He takes all of the bags and then walks upstairs. As I finish saying the, oh, thank you, you really didn't have to do that, lines and unlock my door, he goes, oh, it's no problem. I know your old man leaves for work early and you're home alone. I barely open the door enough to walk into my apartment before I can turn around and he's walked in. He opened up my fridge and puts the milk in and he starts looking around our apartment and into our bedroom. And now just for context of why I didn't flip out and start screaming, it was 8 in the morning and the two other people who live in our building were gone so literally no one would have heard me. He's probably 6'2 and I'm 5'5 five five if I have on some thick shoes and I say, okay, thanks for the help, I'll see you around. And he continues to dig through the fridge and looking towards my bed. Then he turns and starts stepping towards me, and then he realizes that I have a very large butcher knife four inches away from my hand, and then he chooses to leave. I call my husband who is at work an hour away crying and tell him what just happened. That night he goes to confront the guy, and he won't answer the door. And so my husband goes up the next day and the guy breaks down crying and tells my husband he doesn't remember anything and he's so sorry and he was just trying to be very neighborly. And my husband just tells him, my wife's a tough girl and she can carry the groceries up herself. Sometime later we woke up one night hearing someone yelling and screaming outside. When we look out our living room window we see the upstairs creeper with blood streaming down his face. He could barely stand screaming at the police. I'm not going to the damn hospital. Apparently, he had gotten into a fight at the pool hall down the street with four or five other guys and gotten his ass kicked. Eventually, the cops got a hold of him and took him to the hospital in cuffs. And the next morning, I went to go get groceries alone and my husband didn't have to work that day. When I came home, he was standing outside smoking a cigarette and you could tell that he was still messed up from whatever he was on the night before. This time, he walked straight up to the car and acted like he was waiting for me to get out, but he stood by the trunk. This was also the first time that I had seen him since the initial incident that he could have thought my husband wasn't home. I called my husband and when he saw that I was on the phone and heard my husband coming down the stairs to the building, he took off running around the corner. My husband took me to the store that day and got me a gun. And now anytime he sees me alone, he just stares, but if my husband is around, he acts like he doesn't even see us. And now I know this might come across as a sort of dumb idiot just whining about her antisocial neighbors, but sometimes I get really scared being here whenever my husband isn't around, and since writing all of this down has made me feel just a little bit less alone, I guess it was worth it. I remember one time I went to this sleepover with some friends when I was really young. I'm pretty sure it was one of the kids' birthdays. I don't even remember who all was there though. I knew maybe three of the kids out of the probably seven or eight that were at the sleepover. What I really remember though was that we all went to sleep in the kids' bedroom. It must have been pretty large to fit us all and we all had sleeping bags and were on the floor. I fell asleep that night around the time everybody else did but I remember that I randomly woke up in the night. After being really confused and groggy for a few seconds because I was not waking up at my house, I remembered things. I was at the sleepover still, and it was still the middle of the night. I just looked around the mostly dark room. The only real light came in from the window, which did not have any blinds on it or anything, and that's when I noticed that another kid was up. I can't remember his name. I hadn't really known him that well, but he was standing at the window and I realized that a person was outside on the other side of the window. 
This was really strange. The person appeared to be a man, but I couldn't really see. I just laid there and watched, and I noticed that this kid appeared to be talking with the man at the window. I had so many questions, starting with, who was this man? Why was he at the window? And why was this kid talking with him? The obvious guess was that he was possibly going to try to kidnap the kid or something. I remember that at that point, I sat up. This was maybe 10 seconds after first seeing what was going on. At that point, I saw the kid turn around and look at me. Then the man at the window quickly disappeared and ran away. I didn't say anything. I'm not really sure why. Maybe I was just so confused, or maybe I was just truly speechless. Anyways, the kid then walked over, got inside of his sleeping bag, and seemed to go back to sleep. I just turned over, and I tried to go back to sleep myself. And eventually, I did, and I didn't hear or see anything else strange. I also was not woken up for the rest of the night. When everybody got up the next morning, we all went to the living room and kitchen for breakfast. I remember that it was then that I saw the kid, and I asked him who was at the window. Surprisingly, the kid completely denied it. He said that he didn't remember going to the window or anything. I told him what happened, and he claimed that I must have been dreaming it. I was so confused. I knew that I wasn't dreaming it, but I didn't say anything else about it for the rest of the time. Well, I ended up seeing the same kid again probably a few months later. It was at another kid's birthday party who we both happened to know. There, I brought it up again. This time, he did not deny it. He told me that he randomly woke up in the night and saw this guy at the window. The guy then waved him over and he went, thinking that the guy must have been a family member of one of the kids or something. He opened the window and the guy was telling him to go around and unlock the front door. That's when he saw me and the guy ran away. He said that he just went to bed after that. He told me that he denied it because he thought he would get in trouble or something. I'm not really sure why, but I'm really glad that the kid didn't listen to the man and unlock the door. And I'm really glad that I woke up when I did. I'm 22 years old. We used to have a neighbor who was around 60 to 70 years old and he died a few years ago. When he was still alive, he would cause us so much trouble. Scratched our car, poisoned our apple trees and grass, blew up a firework near me to cause me to temporarily go deaf on one ear when I was like four, all kinds of things. His son was a judge in our city so pretty much everything we took to court was against us, and I remember dad often called us from work to tell us not to be alone at home and we would have to stay at grandma's. When I was little, I think about six or seven, I would frequently have nightmares about seeing a face outside the bathroom window. The window is above our bathtub. It's high enough that no one can actually see in unless they climb the roof on our shed which is underneath the bathroom window in our garden. Coincidentally, the shed is directly next to a fence that separates our garden from the neighbor's one. I still remember the dreams. I remember having them pretty much every other night. And I never told my parents when I was little because we never really talked about anything. So I didn't really share anything that was happening to me. Well, I grew up thinking that they were just dreams and that was it. I did mention them to my therapist last year because we were discussing some personal problems and I felt like this was kind of connected. After coming home, mom asked me what I talked about with my therapist so I finally shared that I used to have such dreams. I never really thought about them being real but she told me that I actually did tell her that I saw our neighbor on our shed's roof. I don't remember telling her that but she said that I did mention it several times and even my friends told her that they saw him there when they came over to our house and it really creeped them out. Apparently I never mentioned him watching me in the shower, but after she told me that it really clicked for me and it was as if I suddenly remembered that yeah, I do think it was him, it would make sense, and the fact that it happened still creeps me out. There was another incident that creeped me out too and it happened when I was around 9 to 10. I went to the balcony in the evening and the balcony door was in my room and I often went there to call my cat home in the evening. But this time I saw a person standing in the middle of our garden. It was already dark out and I couldn't really tell who it was. I waited for a little bit to see what the person does but I didn't really see him move. It was as if he was just standing there and staring in front of him. I called out, Dad? Because obviously I expected it to be him even though I found it odd. 
but the person looked up at me and even though it was dark, I could tell it was someone else. I think it was partly because my eyes had just adjusted to the dark and I could make out the silhouette of the person better. And I went to tell my dad who was downstairs, but when he looked, there was no one there. When I went back upstairs to my room and went to the balcony again, I noticed my neighbor's back door closing just when I looked there. I don't remember if it was directly the next day or a few days later, but our grass turned brown and we found out it was poisoned, most of the grass being out of reach from his property. This happened back when I was a kid in the early 2000s. I remember it like it was yesterday though. So I think I was about 10 and I lived with my parents and two younger sisters at the time. We also lived about 10 minutes away from a huge shopping mall. I went there many times as a kid. One sunny Saturday morning, all five of us went down to the mall. The reason we were going is because my younger sister wanted to see some celebrity that was having a meet and greet or something. I don't remember exactly who it was or what the situation was, but I know that I wasn't really a fan. So when we arrived, the mall was very busy. My mom and sister got in line where all the other girls were waiting. Me, my dad, and younger sister went to walk around the rest of the mall and wait. My dad took us to the center of the mall, which had a large amusement park. We went to the arcade and played some games there for a while. After some time of this, my mom and sister were still in line with the large crowd, and my youngest sister was going to go on some little kid's ride. I was hungry, and my dad gave me some money to go and get some food. So I left the area and walked down some crowded hallways. I was looking for the pretzels and walked for probably like five minutes away. As I struggled to find the pretzels, I was passing by hundreds of different people. I remember that sometime when I was walking, I felt a tap on my shoulder from behind. I looked back and there was a man standing there, but I didn't know who he was. At first, I was very confused, and I didn't know if he was mistaking me for somebody else. But the man said that he had to talk to me, and he motioned for me to go to the side. I went a little off to the side, away from where everybody was walking and in front of a random store. The man asked me what I was doing walking around the mall by myself. I told him that I was just going to get a pretzel. That's when the man told me that he would buy one for me and asked me to go with him. Now, I knew better than this, and I realized at this point that the man was a total stranger. So I told him no, and instead of continuing to go find the pretzels, I instead started to walk back over to my parents. I remember that at first, the man started to walk after me, which made me pretty nervous, but this didn't last long. I was able to quickly blend in with the large crowd by walking kind of fast. I lost the guy pretty easily. He didn't really seem to chase after me that close and he gave up. I was able to quickly walk back over to find my parents. My mom and younger sister were still in line and my dad and youngest sister were on the ride. So I waited for my dad and sister and then I told them about what happened when the ride was over. Then the three of us went to get pretzels together. I was looking out for the man who had approached me but I did not see him. Afterwards, we found a table near where my mom and other sister were and we sat down there. After a while, my mom and sister were finally done. I remember that after that, we all went someplace else, I can't remember. But when we were going to leave, we were approaching the hallway that I had walked down where the guy approached me. The area was much more clear now and there were multiple police officers, as if something had happened. We all wondered about it, but ended up just walking past it and going away. However, I remember later that day when we got home, my parents said that the police activity was caused by an attempted child abduction. After learning a man was arrested and seeing that it was near where the man had approached me, we figured it to be the same guy. It really creeps me out. But I also feel very lucky that I had just walked away from the guy when he talked to me. I'm also happy that the man was not able to successfully kidnap anybody. This is a real story that has absolutely traumatized my boyfriend and I. Just over two years ago, I moved to the UK to study at Leeds University. I always wanted to go there and get away from my parents as the situation at home was beginning to become too toxic for me 
and so moving away to study seemed like an ideal solution. During my first year at university, I moved into student accommodation and met some really nice people. It was a good year, one in which I met my boyfriend and I greatly enjoyed my time away from my family and discovering what independence really meant. As second year came by, I decided with some friends to move into a house rented by student accommodations. It wasn't as nice as the university accommodations, but at least we had our own house and weren't restricted as much with noise, which meant that we could throw parties and all of that. I had a ground floor room and my window gave into a small backyard in which I could go smoke every day as I am a smoker, and in which there would be a very thin wooden door giving into the other side of the street where you would put your bins. The door could only be closed and locked from inside the backyard, but since it was an old door, we had to attach some strings to keep it closed for good. I had neighbors on each side of the house, so we were surrounded by families and some other student accommodations. The neighbors on the right of us were five boys who looked way over the age of being in university, and they seemed very strange, and at one point I happened to run into one of them outside of our house one day because of a police intervention. He said one of his flatmates attacked him and the others with a kitchen knife and afterwards had tried to burn the kitchen down. I heard some screams and so I went outside with my flatmates and saw one of them. He was covered in blood and cuts with many on his arm and a wound on his head inflicted by the kitchen knife. My flatmates and I didn't know what to do so we offered him our help to clean himself up and then gave him an old t-shirt to change out of his bloody clothes. We then saw the guy who heard his flatmates being escorted out by police and into a van, presumably after being arrested for attacking his flatmates. I don't know anything more about the story and the police didn't really tell us anything either. But anyway, the guy who we helped was quite weird. He said a lot of BS and kept trying to flirt with me, but I didn't really care in the moment as we just wanted to make sure that he was okay because seeing him in such a sorry state was very shocking. And after some time had passed, I would be coming back home from uni and see him quite often in the street. I never said a word to him, but he'd always be looking at me. One day, he came up to me in the street while I went to the corner shop and started talking to me weirdly, in such a way that I really didn't feel comfortable. I told him I was too busy to talk to him in the street and he replied, Oh, that's okay. I'll just wait for you at the front of the house then. We can get to know each other better when you come back. And needless to say, I was exceptionally creeped out by this. I bought my drink at the shop and headed back to my street, and as I turned onto the street where my house was, I saw him with his flatmate sitting on my doorstep, waiting for me. And I panicked. I went back next to the corner shop and called my only guy flatmate to ask him to open the door and tell those guys to go away. But Saad's law applied in this case, as the English might say, and not only was he not home when he answered my call, but no one else was either. I literally waited for an hour walking up and down the high street before I went back to check if the coast was clear. And then when I saw that it was, I sprinted back home and locked the front door. After this already pretty scary encounter, I just tried to avoid the guy and mostly succeeded for a while. But then one day, as I went smoking in the backyard... I noticed that the wooden door, which is always closed, was open, and the strings that we put there to keep it closed were cut off. For whatever reason, I didn't think anything of it and just closed the door again and put a new string on it, thinking it was one of my flatmates who took the bins out and just didn't tie it back. The weird neighbors would very often scream and yell and fight in their house, and it would wake me and my flatmates up in the middle of the night, but we kind of got used to it after a while. But one evening, my boyfriend slept over like he usually did, and he, who usually never ever wakes up because of a noise, woke up in the middle of the night because of a bang and some whispering. I was sound asleep so he very silently woke me up and we both just waited in the dark and listened for any noises. Suddenly we heard the wooden door just bang, just shot open and some footsteps next to my window. I always had my window open because it would get really warm inside, so we both just froze there. And then we heard the door leading to the backyard get shaken softly as if they were trying to get inside, and then they stopped. 
Luckily, we had the curtains closed so they couldn't see us, but we were ready to get dressed and get the F out of that room and lock them in if they came in from the window. Then we just heard my window move and get more open, and one of the guys saying something in a different language that we didn't understand and started to hear them trying to get in. My boyfriend and I just shot up out of bed, took my phone and put clothes on and ran out of the room and out of the house. I then called my flatmates and told them to lock themselves in their rooms and then the police very luckily came in less than five minutes as the headquarters were a couple of streets down from us. I don't remember anything after the police came. I think my boyfriend and I were in shock. They ended up catching one guy, the other fled and was later found a few streets up smoking weed. The police told us that they went inside their house and found a lot of cocaine and heroin and that they were carrying a massive kitchen knife with them. I was so confused as I had never done anything to offend or do anything wrong to my neighbors so the idea of them breaking in with God knows what intentions with a kitchen knife terrorized me and my boyfriend. The two guys ended up being arrested and one of them was put in prison for two years for carrying a weapon with intention to harm. I never heard anything else from the police and I moved back home a few months later as I was so scared and it tormented me for months on end not knowing what would have happened if my boyfriend didn't wake up. I'm now still coping with it and finding it really tough to get over it, of always asking myself what if and what would have happened. I now very often wake up because of the slightest noise and get horrible nightmares because of it, but hey, at least I'm still with my boyfriend and we often talk about it, which does help me a lot. This happened back when I was 12 years old. I was going to a sleepover at my best friend Julia's house. I remember that I went over to her house in the afternoon, and in the early evening we went to this park. There was a park within walking distance of her house, and it was just a few blocks away. It would take less than 10 minutes to get there along the sidewalks. Julia and I both played softball together, so we went to the park to practice. The two of us walked there, and when we got to the park, we were the only ones there. It had one softball field, a few benches, a large open area of grass, and some trees scattered around. The park was surrounded by the residential neighborhood. So we started playing catch and did some fielding practice as well. Probably like 45 minutes into being there, only a few people had passed by. Occasionally somebody would walk their dog through the park or something like that. But then there was this man who we noticed. He walked to the park and was wearing sunglasses. The guy then went and sat down at this bench not far from the field. He sat down and just started watching us. We continued not thinking too much of it. I didn't look at the guy for a long time. Probably 30 to 45 minutes after that though, he was still there. And that's when we were about done. We then got our stuff and started walking back to Julia's house. Now we had to walk past the man because the bench that he was on was right next to the walking path. We did, and not long after, he got up and seemed to start following us. Because as we walked on the sidewalk and left the park, we could hear the guy about 30 or 40 feet back. Neither of us said anything, but when we turned and went up a block and the guy was still there, I think we were both thinking the same thing. I remember that Julia suggested we not go straight home and we take a different way. She didn't say why, but I knew it would be to try to lose the guy following us. At the end of that street, we went right instead of going straight. Then we went right again at the next block. I stopped hearing the guy, and after looking back, we didn't notice him following anymore. We then went and turned around, and then went around the block before going back to Julia Street. Once we got there, we did not see the man, and we went inside of her house. Julia and I hung out inside, and I had my sleeping bag and stuff to stay the night. So we were both in Julia's room just hanging out and talking hours later, and we both stayed up pretty late. We were the only ones still up by probably midnight. Julia's bedroom was at the front side of the house. I remember that her blinds were closed, but at one point she got up and looked out of the window. She then told me that she could see that creepy guy that was following us. I thought that she was joking at first, but as she kept looking outside, I got up to see for myself. When I got to the window, sure enough, he was there. 
The guy was standing on the sidewalk right in front of Julia's yard. He was still wearing sunglasses and kind of looking around. We were wondering what he was doing. Then he appeared to look over at us and notice us. We both ducked down immediately as fast as we could. After a few moments, Julia carefully looked up and slightly opened the blinds again. When she did, she said that he was coming into the yard. We both ran out of the room and into the hallway. Julia then went and woke up her parents. Meanwhile, I did not hear any kind of a knock at the door or anything. I wasn't sure where the man was. A few minutes later, Julia's dad went outside to look for the guy, but he was gone by then. We thought about calling the police, but did not. For the rest of the time, the guy did not return. Neither of us saw him again, but it still creeps me out to think back to it. This happened back when I was a teenager and in high school. I was a freshman and I lived in a house in the suburbs, not too far outside of the city. It was a densely populated area and we lived about a mile away from a pretty large mall. It was also about a half mile from my school, so it was a popular hangout for a lot of the kids. I would go there with friends after school some days or on weekends other times. One weekend, I was at the mall with four of my friends Jesse, Alex, Martin, and Lisa. We walked around and did some shopping. Then we were all hanging out in one of the food courts, sitting at a table and talking. It was at this time when a random woman approached the table. She appeared to be in her 30s and had dark blonde hair and was wearing sunglasses. We all looked up at her and the woman said that she needed to talk to me specifically. I didn't know why because I had never seen her before. I asked her what and she told me just to follow her so I got up and asked her again what it was she wanted to talk to me about. The woman then told me to follow her and she would explain, so I did. By now, I was very curious. We went to the end of the food court and then turned into a random walkway in the mall. After walking for longer than I expected, the woman turned down this other hallway. This one, though, was very long and skinny. There were no stores down this hallway, but just some storage closets or possibly janitor's closets. I was very confused but for some reason, I kept walking. I also remembered that at the end of the hallway, there was an exit sign. When we got about halfway down the hallway, I actually saw the door to one of the storage closets open up. At least, I assumed that that's what those rooms were. When it did, these two men walked out. They were both looking at me and were starting to approach. Now, at this point, I still didn't know what was going on, but something about the situation gave me a bad feeling. I stopped where I was and I asked the woman what was happening. She just told me to come on and to follow her. The men now started walking in my direction. My instincts were telling me to leave, so I just turned around and started walking away. I heard footsteps moving after me and heard the woman tell me to come back, but I ignored it. This only made me go faster. I was able to make it back out to a normal walkway where there were a few other people around. I did not see the woman or the two men leave the small hallway that we had been in. I walked back to my friends and they all asked me what that was about. When I told them what had happened, they were very confused. Then the five of us went back to the hallway to look, but the people were gone. So we started walking around the mall and doing a little more shopping. About 30 minutes later, I remember I noticed the woman walking a ways behind us. At that point, we decided to leave. It was very weird. Luckily, we were not followed out of the mall. After that, I never saw any of those people again. I'm not sure what was going to happen if the woman was setting me up to get robbed or something. I really don't know. It just seemed very suspicious. So, this has been a few years since this happened, but to this day, I feel almost sick thinking about that night. When I was in my very early 20s, I had lived in a very cheap and very crappy apartment block that was known for being extremely sketchy. There was this neighbor that always seemed to be listening to James Brown and Motown, so even though he seemed a bit off, I thought, how could he be that weird if he's just chilling to some old school music? I'd heard him blast his music and have louder conversations, but then again, we both had studio apartments that were 
touching, so I would just play music to not hear him so loudly. Now one night, he was drinking a lot and had his girlfriend around. You could hear him being belligerent, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary for him, I suppose. It wasn't too late, so I headed out for the night with some friends while my boyfriend stayed in. I got dropped off at around 1am or so as we were driving into the parking lot from afar and we saw my neighbor outside in between cars in the apartment looking sort of odd. Okay, weird. Whatever this guy is, kind of just creepy anyways. And at that point, my friends were more weirded out than I was, but I didn't think much of it and had them drop me off near the entrance because it was easier for them to leave. And that was until they drove away and... I walked up to go into my apartment, which I had to pass him first. I swear my heart dropped because he was standing still by then with his body hidden by the bush that is between our apartments, like the funny Simpsons meme, but actually not funny whatsoever because as I approached, it seemed like he thought maybe I didn't see him because it was so dark out and he was still as a statue. I waved and mumbled hi because I freaking see you and I'm not going to pretend that I don't at this point, so don't even try anything since no one was out on the weekday at this hour. And at that point, after acknowledging that he was there, he stepped out of the side of the bush and came into the dim porch light, and never in my life have I looked into eyes like that, and my heart is racing as I type this. They were widened, dark, fully dilated just like a wild animal, almost lunatic if I were to express his energy as well. He didn't say anything, but gave me a bone-chilling look and I ran into my apartment immediately. My boyfriend was drowsy since it was late, but he did say my neighbor's music was loud and continued for some time and he heard a ton of noise and arguing earlier but didn't think anything of it. And that night, all night we heard thumps and it sounded like furniture was moving. Now, it just weirded me out knowing that he was awake in that state that I viewed him in, which seemed almost primal. The next morning, I heard the cops outside banging on his door and was partially relieved to see them, but then super scared of why they were there in the first place. They took him away in handcuffs shortly after demanding to be let in and asked me when was the last time I talked to or seen him, and I told him about that night the arguing noises, frightening encounter, and thumping all night. What I found out during the next day will make my stomach turn forever. I was told by this groundskeeper, details I will keep simple since it was horrendous, that James Brown listening neighbor brutally murdered his girlfriend that night, dismembered parts of her and dragged the rest of her body near the train tracks which was directly behind our apartments. It hit me that the cold, primal, and wide-eyed look that I had seen in that man was that of a person who just took another human being's life in such a vicious and disgusting way. I felt so sad for this woman who didn't deserve to go like that. She was always quiet, sweet, and seemed a bit down on her luck, usually asking for cigarettes when I encountered her. And to this day my stomach still turns thinking about how close I was to death quite literally and how he could have ambushed me out of insanity since he was just waiting in the darkness when I walked up. Basically to all of you who follow their intuition and gut feeling, listen to it. If you have a bad feeling about someone even if they seem harmless, stay a safe distance the hell away from them. I moved into a different apartment right after because it was just too much thinking about what had happened. That neighbor went to jail and I saw his booking photo. So damn scary to see him again. And I just hope that he's staying in jail where he belongs. One time when I was younger, I had a sleepover with four of my friends. We had a bit of a friend group and would hang out all the time. We were at Riley's house, which was pretty big and also pretty nice. What I really remember about the night started pretty late though. We were all hanging out and talking and it was past midnight. All Riley's family, including his parents, had gone to bed upstairs. Meanwhile, we were down in the living room, which is where we would all be sleeping. So at some point, 
the front doorbell rang. It obviously caught all of our attention. The conversation that we were having and the jokes that we were making instantly stopped. There was then dead silence for a few seconds. Then we all started talking again, wondering who it could be. Riley then stood up and started walking to the other side of the house where the front door was. All the rest of us naturally got up and followed. When we got to the front of the house, Riley said that nobody was there. We all went to the front door, and I remember that when I looked, sure enough, whoever rang the bell was gone. This was pretty strange. In fact, Riley took a few steps outside to look around. Nothing seemed unusual. We then all decided to go back to what we were doing. When we got back to the living room, the discussion became talking about who it could be. Some of us thought that it was maybe another friend pranking us. After talking for probably another 10 to 20 minutes, the doorbell suddenly rang again. This time, we all got up at once and headed again to the front of the house. When we got there, once more, nobody was seen outside. Riley opened up the door again. This time though, all five of us went outside and looked around. We looked around the front yard and into the street a little bit and even went around to the backyard. After a thorough inspection though, we did not come up with anything. We all then went back inside and back to the living room again. It seemed as though whoever was doing this had gotten away with it. Probably another 10 or 20 minutes went by. Then, all of a sudden, we heard another noise. It was not a doorbell though. It was the sound of the front door opening. We could not believe it. But then, we realized that when we all went back inside, whoever came in last had forgot to lock the door. We realized that whoever had been doing this to us was now inside of the house. We couldn't see from where we were, and we were not close to the stairs to go up, but we were near the stairs to go down to the basement. So all at once, we ran for it and went downstairs. Once in the basement, we basically all hid. It didn't seem like a possible prank anymore. I mean, it was really late at night, and somebody had actually entered the house. For a while, as we all hid downstairs, things were completely silent. After probably 10 minutes of this, we started to whisper to each other. Then, after a while of this, we started to talk. Then finally, we decided to go upstairs and check. We hadn't heard any noises like somebody walking around or anything, so we carefully went back up. Once we did, we didn't see or hear anything. We checked the house and went upstairs. Nobody was there. We realized that whoever had entered must have left as well. We locked all the doors and then went back into the living room. There was no more ringing of the doorbell or anything. We eventually fell asleep and the next morning talked about it again. We even searched the house again, but nobody was there. We're all still friends to this day and still bring it up from time to time. I have no idea who it was that did that to us. So today, as I was going out for coffee, I decided to check out a new cafe that just opened. As I approached the door, I was surprised and happy to see an ex-girlfriend of mine from when I was a kid. We stared at each other for a second, and then I saw her mumble something before coming toward me. I went in for a hug, and after we greeted, she simply asked, Do you remember what you did to me? And I was baffled. We had dated many years ago and never had any issues of any kind. No major fights, no abuse, no toxicity. In fact, she left me because I wouldn't commit, but... We remained on good terms for a while afterward, still hanging out until she found a job abroad and left. At first, I was scared out of my mind and immediately sensed something very strange. I asked her to be more specific, but she wasn't forthcoming, and after a little chit-chat, she told me that she was referring to the time when my friend and I cleansed her house. It then came back to me at the time, we were some stupid, edgy, semi-goth kids who were really into weird and otherworldly stuff. And after she complained about her house feeling strange, a friend from our group offered to perform a cleansing ritual, which he did while we were basically half drunk. According to her, when she talked about this years later with other people, things started to go wrong. She began to feel a presence around the house, experienced drops in temperature, all that eerie stuff. She was vague, but apparently she believed some kind of ghost is now haunting her house, Something that was unleashed after the ritual and started manifesting after she mentioned it to her friends. Nothing happened in years prior. She eventually returned to England but promptly came back here to escape from an abusive fiancé. 
At that point, I was really nervous and made an excuse to leave, and she hugged me, said there is now only Christ in her heart, and suggested that we should really have a cup of coffee. And this gave me a really weird vibe, like something from a cult. I basically ran away, terrified. Keep in mind, we split on some very good terms. She looked after my dog while I was in England. As a masseuse, she took care of my bad back for months. She even introduced me to her new boyfriend, and we went out for dinner a couple of times as a group. There's no way that she could have held any animosity toward me. In fact, once she was abroad, she even offered to help me find a job in the city where she was living. This was not a prank to get back at me. And more than that, her eyes. She was once the light of the room, always laughing and cracking jokes. But the person I saw today was sad with very still eyes, not smiling or anything, like a completely different person. My earliest memory of a nightmare turned out to be a real event. So that title sounds like a no-sleep story, and that's the first thing I thought when I first found this out about two months ago. I've been busy dealing with the wake of a family tragedy since then, but now that things are returning to the new normal, I figured it's a good time to share this, and I'm sorry in advance for any formatting issues here. Now first, I'll describe the nightmare. It's a very short dream, like I said it's a very clear memory just because of how scary it was. I was about four or five years old, perhaps six at the most, and my twin brother and I had a bunk bed in a room at the furthest end of the house that we grew up in. The nightmare had me in my bed looking out the window to see a red sky, the kind it gets in the early dawn hours before sunrise but light still colors the sky. And the next and only other thing I remember in this nightmare is that a man with crazy blue colored eyes and a bald head appears at the window and stares right at me. The nightmare ends there but I remember just how much I screamed and screamed about it. I don't know where my brother was at the time when I woke up screaming and the only thing I can remember from when I woke up was having my mom come and get me and calm me down as she took me to her bedroom down the hall. I remember that event so well because I wondered where my dad was at the time. Now fast forward to this May and my father is in a hospital in Colombia, the country where he lives. My twin brother, our older sister and I are staying in a hotel about a five minute walk from the hospital where he's in the ICU. One night, after a long day of being there for Dad and the extended family, my siblings and I return to the hotel, sit together to have a couple of beers and try to relax after everything. We start discussing things, just trying to unwind, and somehow the topic of nightmares and dreams comes up. I bring up the story above, and without missing a beat, my sister explains that it really happened, that some guy really did look through my window and she remembers the whole thing. My sister, who was five years older than my brother and I, which would make her nine or ten years old at the time, had a bedroom adjacent to the room my brother and I shared. Her room faced our front lawn and the street while our room faced the neighbor's house in their driveway, with a very low fence between the two houses. While she didn't go into too much detail about the days before this nightmare slash event, she said that she had been followed by a bald man in a truck as she rode her bike home with some friends a couple of times before. The day immediately before this nightmare was no different, but this time the man actually drove right past the house. At the time, she was a latchkey kid since my brother and I had to attend a special school about 45 minutes away from our hometown for a speech impediment that many twins have, and my mom had to pick us up rather than be home for my sister's after school. However, she was never home alone for more than an hour. That afternoon and evening were pretty normal as she remembers it. My dad came home from his job, he worked part time as a cop in a local hardware store, and we all had dinner, did homework, played and did the usual family things before bed. That night, at around 12 to 1 a.m., this bald headed man parked down the street at a small industrial park, walked up to our house and tried to get in through my sister's window, which woke her up. She screamed when she saw the man nearly opening the window as it wasn't locked. My dad stormed in and tried to shove the guy out or hit him with his nightstick, and my sister doesn't remember exactly which caused the man to run off. 
but he only stayed away for a short time before returning to try to get in through the window in my room. He tried opening the window, but it was locked because my mom didn't want my brother and me to open it as our bed was right up against it. My sister said I screamed as loud as I could, and my mom came in to get my brother and me while my dad ran out the front door to chase the guy, but to no avail, as the man fled through our backyard. Our backyard was situated against a small rail yard, part of the aforementioned industrial park. Between our small neighborhood and that rail yard was a dense patch of trees that always made the backyards very dark, so my dad didn't want to risk being attacked there. And instead, he went back inside and called the police, and then called our elderly neighbor to make sure that they were okay while our mom took care of us kids. This is all my sister could remember from that night herself, as this happened a very long time ago. Neither of us can recall anything else after that, and the story sort of just stops there. Unfortunately, my father passed away in the hospital, so we can't ask him about it. Given everything that's happened, none of us had thought to ask our mom yet, but... Maybe I'll ask her soon. I just woke up in the middle of the night remembering this and needed to get it off my chest. When I was about 16, my father, brothers, and I lived in an old rundown house in the middle of nowhere. It was a private rental. My brother would do work for the landlord to pay our rent. Our landlord never came off as particularly creepy, but that could be because I rarely went outside when he came over to talk to my dad, and he wouldn't dare do anything in front of my father. I was home alone one day. My dad and brothers went out somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, and I had my dog in a fenced-in yard outside, but that was it. I was in my room doing whatever I was doing, probably playing The Sims too, and we lived in the middle of nowhere and there was a long driveway which the window of my bedroom directly faced. I couldn't see or hear anyone driving up the driveway. I saw a car, not my dad's, and kind of immediately freaked out. I ran and shut all the blinds in the house and turned off all the lights and checked the doors, making sure that they were locked. It was our landlord. He lived next door about two miles from our house and yes, that was the closest house. This wasn't the first time that he'd come here unexpectedly. It happened twice before and both times I was home alone. Those first two times he was only there for ten minutes, walking around the outside of the house and then quickly leaving, but this time was different. I grabbed a big kitchen knife and hid under the kitchen table. I heard him pull up outside and open our front gate. My dog outside was going crazy and barking and I heard him yell, Shut up, you mutt! and I could hear his footsteps walking up to the door. He tried to open the front door and I was freaking out. At this point I texted my dad and he was coming straight home but they'd be like an hour. He continued to walk around the outside of our house trying to peek into each window. The house is old and has three doors that you can enter from the outside and he tried to open all three. I thought maybe that he didn't know that I was home. Maybe the last two times were just a coincidence but he started saying things, including calling out my name, and he knew that I was home alone. I couldn't hear what else he was saying through the double brick walls, but I quietly creeped through the house following his voice up and down the hallway. I was trying to hear what he was saying, and that's when he said something that I'll never forget. I'm going to burn this house down, but I'll let you out first. Of course, I didn't take him seriously, which scares me even more. He wanted me to come out. He wanted me to take his threat seriously. And that's the part that gets me. I know exactly what would have happened if I had believed him and my life would have been completely different. He was there for at least a half an hour, maybe closer to an hour, and he was very persistent, and he left before my dad came home. I told him everything and we moved out soon after. I still don't know how he knew that I was home alone, and my dad never saw him on the way driving out, so he knew my dad was gone because there was no car in the driveway. But how did he know I wasn't with him, and why did he act like that?
This happened two years ago now. I went shopping at a very large mall that's fairly close to where I live. I had been there many times before and was mostly familiar with it. It was a weekend when I was there and there were countless other people. I parked in a parking garage and then was inside the mall shopping for several hours. I got quite a few different things. So after I was finally done shopping, I started to head out of the mall. By this time, it was probably about 4 or 5 p.m. Things were much quieter now, but still a decent amount of other people were there. I left the mall to go back to my car in the parking garage. I remember that I had parked on like the fourth level. When I arrived at my vehicle, which was parked up against one end, there were not as many cars around as before. But I noticed something on my vehicle that seemed strange. I walked closer, and I realized that there were multiple photographs taped to my car. Some were on the windshield, and others were on the side windows. In total, there was probably ten photographs. I was very confused at first, and had no idea who would have done this. Then I actually looked at the pictures. Most of them were of me, and they were taken that same day as I shopped in the mall. Many of the pictures appeared to be taken at a distance, and some of them were zoomed in a decent amount. One of them was taken just feet away from me, and the person had clearly been walking directly behind me. It sent a shiver down my spine. I took all the pictures off of my car, then looked around the parking garage. All of a sudden, I was paranoid that I was being watched. I didn't notice anybody, but there were many possible hiding places. Then I got inside my car and locked the doors. I started looking at the pictures again. This was extremely creepy. I thought back to my time in the mall and tried to remember seeing anything strange. I really couldn't though, there were so many people there. It would have probably been pretty easy to take pictures of people without them knowing. I really had no idea who had done this or why, but I decided to just leave. As I drove out of the parking garage, there were not too many other cars driving around, but there were some coming and going. When I was descending down to get to the ground level, a car showed up behind me. After leaving the parking garage, I drove down this road near the mall, then I got onto a ramp to go onto the highway. The only reason I noticed the car behind me doing the same thing was because it was following really close. And that's when I got suspicious that maybe it was the person who had been taking the photos. Of course, I also thought that maybe I was just being really paranoid. By now, there were lots of other cars on the road because this was a major highway. Still, I kept an eye on it. The car behind me was a kind of SUV and it maintained a close distance. I continued with the drive for a while, which was to go on this highway for about 10 minutes. Then I would get off on an exit close to the city that I lived in. On the highway, nothing changed, but there was nothing too crazy about that. When I took the exit off the highway though, the car behind me also did. That's when I got really nervous. They had to be following me. So it seemed like someone, for some reason, was stalking me. I looked in my mirror, but could not really tell who was driving. I didn't have a good enough view. So now that I was off the highway, I was less than five minutes from my house, but I knew I couldn't go there. That's when I decided to drive to the police station. I wasn't sure off the top of my head where the nearest one was, so I put in the maps on my phone to get directions. The station wasn't too far away, so I followed the directions there. The car behind me followed as well, all the way up until the street before the police station. Then it stopped. I drove there, parked, and then went inside with all the pictures and reported everything that happened. I gave a description of the car, but I didn't get the license plate and couldn't tell the exact model of the car. I felt stupid for not taking better notes of those things. There was not a whole lot that could be done. After that, I went home. I was paranoid for the next few days, thinking this person somehow knew where I lived, but I was not bothered again. I even went back to that mall a couple of weeks later and nothing happened. To this day, I don't know how to explain it. Maybe it was somebody's idea of an elaborate joke. I just hope that nothing like this ever happens again.